begin here as our service, I want to give God some glory. Um, yesterday, if you did not see a Facebook post my wife made, I was out shooting my crossbow, getting it ready for deer season. For those guys who know, we have less than a month for deer season. Um, and as I was getting ready to shoot the third arrow and I squeezed the trigger, my drawstring exploded on my crossbow and caught me right underneath the eye. Um, but praise God, there was no wounds, there was no bruising or anything. Uh, just scared me really bad, but we know that's from God's protection, and so I want to give God the glory for that, that even though we don't always see all his hand on us and his protection, he is still working today. We don't serve a God who is asleep or who doesn't care about us, but he takes care of us, and we praise him for that. Daniel and his family are on vacation down in the Branson area, getting to explore Branson. As many of us know how wonderful that is, they're getting to see all the wonderful things down there in Branson and having a good time. And so they'll be back on Monday, and he'll be back in the office on Tuesday. And so always great when our pastor can get away for vacation. And today I will be preaching from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. It's always exciting to preach the Word of God. Um, it's also a scary and terrifying thing, too, because it is the Word of God, and you want to handle it correctly and obediently and follow the Lord. And so we're going to be in the letter of Philippians in the New Testament, kind of give you a little background of Philippians. Um, this is written by Paul, the Apostle Paul. We see that in chapter 1, verse 1, and Timothy is with him. Um, he is probably under house arrest or in prison. We do know he's in prison this time. In Rome, it was written somewhere between 60 to 62 A.D., and so Paul is under arrest right now for preaching the gospel. It was when he was in Jerusalem, the Jews wanted to kill him because of him preaching the gospel. They believed he was going against the law, which he was not. And since he was a Roman citizen, he appealed it to Caesar. And so he is in Rome right now waiting. The church in Philippi and the brethren, he wants to encourage them to keep following Christ. And Paul has a special heart for this church because this is the church he started in Acts 16, 13. You see that he started a church in Philippi. And right before that, he found Timothy and started discipling Timothy. And so both him and Timothy know these people and know this church very well. And so as Paul's sitting in prison, getting reports about the churches, he's writing to encourage them. Like most of Paul's letters, there is not one set goal for this letter. Paul has several themes through it. And even Paul updates about his life in chapter 1, telling them why he's in prison and what's going on. But kind of the theme, if you want to put a theme to a letter, is joy. Paul uses the Greek word for joy and rejoicing 16 times in only 104 verses. Yet Paul is writing from a dingy Roman prison, a place we typically would associate with misery and trial, which most people assume about prison. Prisons are not a good place to be, especially if you're in one. But yet, this is the opposite of what Paul is. He's joyful. He is teaching the Philippians how to have a right mind during trials, during hardships. A famous verse that we probably most of us know is Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And if you read the whole entire chapter of Philippians 4, Paul is talking about how he can face hardships, face persecution, shipwreck, go hungry, be cold, be thirsty. He can do it all because Christ strengthens him. And that is the main goal of chapter 4. But today we're going to be in chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 1. And this section here, Paul has changed, changed gears from chapter 1. And he moves on how to have unity in the body of Christ and how to be humble in the body of Christ. So let us read Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 11. If you're able, will you stand with me in the honor of God's word? As it is his inspired word that he wrote to Paul and for us. Paul writes, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. 
but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him that the, a name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words. We thank you for your scriptures that are, le that are living and breathing. Lord, that pierce our hearts and convict us and help us to become more like you. Lord, let this sermon glorify you. Let your words come out of my mouth. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have here as Paul is writing to the church, and as I said before, Paul is making a call in this section of chapter 2 for unity. Paul wants the church in Philippians uh, to be unified. He does not want division because he knows that division can creep in. He knows that there are those that are going around spreading a false gospel, trying to destroy the work of Jesus Christ and the work that Paul has done by the hand of Jesus Christ. And so Paul is going to make a, a case here why they should be unified together and also how they should be humble. Paul does not want the church in Philippi to get over or be get proud, to think highly of themselves. Paul wants to remind them of how they should live. And since he can't be there to watch them, he's going to send this letter to them. It could be through Timothy, Luke, or many others who would have taken the letter to the church of Philippi and got it there. And so we're going to see it in our point one here. How to have unity in the church. We're going to see this in the first four verses that we just read. And in verse 1, Paul gives us four motivations to unity. In just verse 1 there, he gives us four motivations to unity. And the first one we see is if you have any encouragement from Christ. And this encouragement that he's talking about is encouragement through the Holy Spirit. The root meaning of this word encouragement in the Greek is to come alongside, to give assistance by offering comfort, counsel, or exhortation. Paul is saying that they shouldn't be divided with the influence of Christ in your life. If you call yourself a Christian and you're with other Christians and you have that encouragement of being a Christian, you should not look to be divided amongst each other. Instead, you should be helping each other. And with Christ in you, it should push you to preserve unity that is so precious to Christ. Did you ever think that Christ wants his body of church to be unified? Unity isn't just something that we like, but it's something that Christ strives for and Christ wants. I think Christ, I know Christ does not like seeing his churches fight amongst each other. His churches argue about secondary doctrine issues or secondary things that are going on. If a church believes that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, he came and lived a perfect life, died on the cross for our sins, there's no other way to heaven except through Jesus, his death and resurrection. He rose on the third day, and he lives with God at the right hand of the Father until his second coming, then we should have unity with him. We should, we should be unified. It doesn't matter their denomination. If they believe the Bible, if they follow the Bible and its teachings, we should be unified with them. And that's what Paul is talking about here. And we should want that. We should have encouragement from the Holy Spirit. If we come to church, even in our own church, and we're against each other, then do we really have Christ inside us? Do we really have the encouragement from the Holy Spirit? We should strive to be united with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ because of the Holy Spirit living in us. And he goes on and he talks about how we're going to give assistance. So the second one we see in verse 1, if we have comfort from love, the idea of giving comfort or solace, both encouragement and love involve a close relationship with one another, marked by genuine concern, helpfulness, and love. Do we have genuine concern for our brothers and sisters in Christ? Do we have genuine helpfulness? We're willing to sacrifice our own needs, our own wants, our own time, 
to help a brother and sister in need even before they ask? Do we have that genuine love? This love that Paul is talking about is the love that Jesus showed to us and shows today to sinners. We didn't deserve God's love. Romans makes it clear we were enemies of God. But yet he loved us first, that he died for us. So in that same love that Jesus gave to us, we should turn around and give it to other Christians. We should show it to one another. Doesn't matter what they've done because we should forgive them as Christ has forgiven us. Doesn't matter if they've helped us out or not because we didn't help Christ out. Instead, Christ gave it to us first. This is the true, genuine concern for one another. Kindness to each other. Just being kind because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We should be showing Christ's attributes to one another. We should be mimicking Christ's love to one another. And when the world looks at us, they see not us, but they see Christ. We portray what our name says, Christian, which was given to the way or the followers of Christ in Antioch. It was actually kind of a mock to say, well, they're acting like this guy named Christ. We'll just call him Christian. So the Christians adapted it and took it on as their name. But do you know that in this, we could also grieve the Holy Spirit? As the third unity, we see any participation in the Spirit with fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit lives in each one of us as Christians. You realize each one of us are a temple of the Lord because the Holy Spirit dwells in that. We see that in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Paul says that our bodies are the temple of the Lord because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And if we do not show Christian kindness to each other, we will be grieving the Holy Spirit. We'll see this here in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 through 32. If you want to turn there with me or it's on the screen. Paul writes, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted." Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So the way we talk, the way we act to one another, as Paul is making a case here, can grieve the Holy Spirit. You ever thought about that? The way you treat someone over social media or the way you talk to them face to face or a text message you say. You're representing Jesus Christ and your words are important. And as Paul says in Ephesians we should not let all these things come out of our mouth. They should be put away from us as Christians. That's the world's way of acting. That's the world's way of not living for Christ. Instead, we should be showing tenderheartedness to one another, kindness, forgiving. Why? Because God in Christ Jesus forgave us. So when you get ready to talk to someone, you should ask these questions. Is this building up this person, this brother or sister in Christ, or is it tearing them down? Is it kind? Would Christ want me to say this? We also see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, that we are baptized into one spirit. We're all bought by the same price, the blood of Jesus Christ. None of us became a Christian through a different way. None of us got a special Christian power. We all received the same Holy Spirit through the same Jesus Christ, through his blood on the cross. And that makes us all one. We being brothers and sisters in Christ is actually supposed to be stronger bond than the bond that we have with our blood family. Think about when, when Paul was writing this letter to the church in Philippi and to other churches where he called for this Christian unity. There were families that were torn apart because one or two would become a Christian and the Jews would cast them out. Or if you were a Greek or a barbarian, as persecution started under Nero, they would be turned over to death because the Romans said you had to worship any other god and the emperor. And Christians came along and said, no, there's only one god. We'll never worship the emperor. 
And remember, Jesus told us this, that brother will turn over sister, and that mother will turn over son, and that father will turn over wife. They would turn each other over. This was what's happening. And so Paul is saying, hey, yeah, your family is split up. Your family has betrayed you and has left you because you became a Christian. But let me tell you of a family that's even stronger and better and greater than your blood family, and that is the church. That is the Christian body of Christ. The family of God is supposed to be stronger than our blood family. And we should show that the way we treat each other. The third reality, or sorry, the fourth reality that moves us to unity, as Paul has here, is affection and compassion. Again, more qualities from Christ. If you think about it, Christ was tenderly comfort those who were weak and oppressed. When he walked on this earth, he went to those that were cast out by the Jewish society. He made one of his disciples a tax collector, which you had sinners, then you had tax collectors. They were the lowest of the low. They were the worst. And why did the Pharisees get mad at Jesus? Because he ate with sinners and tax collectors. He talked with women, which was something you were not supposed to do during that time. He touched leopards who had never been touched in who knows how many years because of their leprosy. He had compassion and tenderness on those that were hurting. And here again, we're supposed to have this deep affection, this longing for those that we care about, especially those that we deeply love in the church. Paul had this longing. He used it in Philippians 1.8. He had a longing to get back to the church. He missed them. He had a longing to see them in their presence. That's why he was writing a letter. He did not know exactly how long he was going to be in prison, though he talks about later on in the letter, prepare a place for him and Timothy because he felt like he was going to be released soon. We should have that deep care for believers in our church, a longing to be with them, a longing to be in their presence. And when they're not here, when we don't see them, we miss them. We check in on them, see how they're doing. Now, during COVID, it's a different time. We have people who are staying home for their health. But are you checking in on them? Are you calling them, saying, hey, I missed you this Sunday. I understand why you can't be here at our church. I just want to let you know I still miss you. I still care for you. And I can't wait for the day when this is all passed and we get to be together in the church. I miss you. Or if you miss them, for any something happened, you couldn't come to church, you long for the next Sunday. This here is with the affection. Sympathy, or as a New American Standard Bible puts it, compassion. This word to have of kindness and gentleness and patience with others as Christ is with us. Being there when others need us, not turning away or ignoring other believers. We see this also in Romans chapter 12, verse 15, which will be up on the screen. As Paul talks about the church in Rome, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We as Christians should walk along one another and be there for the hard times and the good times. We shouldn't turn away one another or say, you've suffered long enough. I can't handle your suffering anymore or you're too much. Can you imagine if Christ did that to us? If all of a sudden you were praying and the Holy Spirit spoke to you in Christ, you know what, I'm kind of tired of your sin, kind of tired of your problems, go find someone else, come back to me when you're, when you're better. We'd be devastated, but Christ never does that. Christ never gives up on us. Christ always welcomes us. Christ is always there for us. He never leaves us or abandons us. And that's what we're supposed to do with other believers. We stay with them, we cry with them, we rejoice with them. When they do, when the good things happen to them, when great things happen to them. You know, these qualities remind us of a story that Paul, or that Jesus told, the Good Samaritan. The parable of the Good Samaritan, where he was walking along the road and he sees a Jew laying there beaten. If you don't understand, the Samaritans and Jews, they were enemies. They, they hated each other so much that the Jews would not even walk into Samaria, yet Jesus plowed his way and went right through Samaria. But the Jews would take the long way around. And Samaria wouldn't even come to the temple because they weren't allowed. So they would worship on the mountain where Jacob had his dream. And, and they didn't like each other. They hated each other. So the Samaritan's walking, and he sees his enemy, a Jew, beaten, robbed, bleeding, getting ready to die. And he could have walked on and said, oh, that's my enemy. It's good for another Jew to die. But no, he has compassion on him. He takes his own bandages, his own medicine, his own oil, and takes care of him. And he puts him on his own donkey and takes him to an inn. Then he takes his own money to the innkeeper and says, here, take care of him. And if this is not enough, when I come back through, I will pay the rest of the bill. 
this is the example as we as Christians are supposed to be to one another. We give up our own money, our own stuff, our own time for each other. No matter if they're going to give it back or not. No matter if we have a fight with them or we don't like them, we give it up anyways. Paul goes on in verse 2 of Philippians chapter 2. It says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being a full of cord and of one mind. So now Paul gives us another three things to look at here on how to keep unity. Now, number one, he says, be of the same mind. Now, this does not mean that we have to agree 100% on all secondary doctrinal issues or political issues or things like that. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul's talking had the same mindset on Christ, that Christ is the only way, that the Bible is the only inspired scripture, and the only way to be saved of our sins is through Jesus Christ. This is what Christ wants the same mind to be. Christ is, or Paul does not want the church to be focusing on worldly things, but on heavenly things. We see this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, as Paul talks about it. Paul says, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. He also states this in Romans chapter 8, in verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. This is what Paul wants the church to have their mind on. They want to have their mind on heavenly things. Because we realize that this is not our home. This is not where we're going to stay. One day we will be in our eternal home in heaven. Too many times the church and Christians get distracted by the world. We chase after things of the world. The church wants to be popular. The church wants more people in its building. They want more money. They want the most fanciest things. And Paul's saying, don't worry about that. Focus on what Christ wants you to do as the church. When you go to your work, are you being a Christian? Are you living on the mission as the church? Because the church, again, is not a building. It is the people. Because during this time, they were meeting either outside or in houses or in secret times. They didn't have big buildings. They were kicked out of the synagogues. They weren't allowed in the temple. So they had to meet wherever they could. So Paul is saying to be the hands and feet of Christ, live on that mission for Christ, to make disciples of all nations. Put your mind on that thing. Not worrying about what tomorrow is going to bring, as Jesus says. Not worrying about the popularity. Not worrying about all these things that can get us sidetracked. But yet put our minds on heavenly things and focus on Christ. He moves on. He says it again in verse 2. The same love. Same love. This unity of love by showing brotherly love to one another. Being willing to serve one another for the sake of Christ. That we are equal in Christ's eyes no matter our skin color, our ethnical background, no matter our income, where we were raised, who our mom and dads were. We show love to one another because we're all bought by the same price of Jesus Christ's blood. That's what Paul is saying. Be unity. Does it matter? And the church had their issues. You read in Corinthians, they had problems with they would look up to the rich. James even addressed this. They let the rich sit in the good places, and then they put the poor on the ground, and then give them the good places. Paul's like, no, none of this is going to happen. Be unified no matter what. Be unified whether you're Republican, Democrat, third party. Don't vote. Be unified. He goes on and talks about this again. Be in one mind. Notice Paul says it twice. Be in one mind. He knows that this is an issue. We don't allow small differences to divide us. We don't allow issues to drive wedges between us and hinder our service to the Lord. It's always amazing when it comes to political season, especially the big presidential political season, how the churches get divided. Even in our own congregation, we can get divided over who we're voting for, who we're not voting for. And we debate on Facebook, and we get mad at each other, and the world's looking at us saying, what in the world is going on? It doesn't matter. Let people vote their conscience. Let people do what the Lord has called them to do. And yes, you can have discussions and talk politely, but if they, agree, if they disagree with you, then that's okay. As long as they're saved in the blood of Jesus Christ, don't make them an enemy. Let them do what the Lord has put upon their hearts to do. 
Don't let what town they grew up in or who their parents were or what they do for a career to divide. That's because one person lives in one town and one person lives in a different town. Don't fight over it. Don't let skin color or race or what country they grew up in or if they're an immigrant or not or all that divide us. If they believe in the Bible, if they believe in Jesus Christ, then welcome them with open arms because they're your brother and sister in Christ and one day they're going to be in heaven with you for eternity. I see this really bad, especially when I was at Bible college. Those that were Calvinists and those that are Arminian and those that were Reformed and not, we, they fought all the time and they debated. And I just sat there and said, what are we doing? We're Christians. We all believe the same thing. And if you just switch over to the other side, I finally asked one of my friends who kept pushing Calvinists so hard. I said, okay, so if I became a Calvinist, what do I gain? I'm already saved. He couldn't answer me. Because I gain nothing. I already have Christ Jesus. There's nothing more that they can offer me. There's nothing more that you can offer anybody else but Jesus Christ. Paul goes on in verse 3 to tell us how to live with each other. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. So here Paul is saying, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. You think Paul made this clear in verses 1 and 2, but he's again going to give us it, say it again in case we missed it. And Paul is making it clear that we should do nothing out of selfishness. Selfishness is the root of all sin. It is placing our will above God's will. It's telling God that I know better than your, what your word says. And selfishness has no place in the Christian life, let alone the church. Selfishness will destroy the church very quickly. No Christian, no matter how strong, is immune from selfishness. And we need to make sure that it dies inside us and does not consume us. We must also watch out for conceit. Conceit seeks personal glory and praise. A person with conceit considers themselves always to be right and expects others to agree with them. The only unity they seek or value is centered on themselves. Selfishness and conceit are the two fastest things that will kill unity in a church and destroy the church of God. We must not allow these two things to live inside us. So how do we kill them? How do we not let them live in, in, in us? Well, Paul gives us the answer in the rest of verse 3. But in humility, count others more significant than yourself. So we do the opposite of selfishness and conceit. In humility, we count others as more important than we count ourselves. Solomon tells us in Proverbs 11:2, pride brings dishonor, but humility brings wisdom. Genuine humility involves believers not thinking more highly than themselves. Helps them to think of others. We look after others' wants and needs instead of our own way. Instead of doing it the way we think it should be done, we're open to other ways, and we're even open to doing it a different way. Maybe a way we're not comfortable with, but it's not going to be wrong. It's not going to hurt someone. We do it a different way. And we look out for our other, for other brothers and sisters, their needs. So maybe I have some extra food, and I know this brother and sister are hungry or hurting, so I give up my extra food. Maybe I have extra money in a savings account, but I know a brother or sister, they need some stuff, so I'm just going to go buy it for them or give them that extra money. Maybe they just have a bunch of trees and limbs down in their yard. They haven't had time to go pick it up or their grass is too long, so I'm just going to go over and mow and pick up those limbs without any pay. And maybe without anybody even knowing that I did it. That's the way we're supposed to do it. As Jesus says, do not let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. So maybe you won't get praise. That's okay. We're not to be doing it for conceit or praise. We're doing it because Jesus did it for us. We're doing it for the glory of the Father. This again reminds us of the Good Samaritan. In verse 4, we finish up point 1 here on how Paul is making the case of how to keep unity. He says, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Again, Paul is hitting this look to the interests of others. He does not want the church to think about itself, but think about others. Looking for the interest of uh, or for your own interests seeks to promote their own ministry priorities at the expense of others. 
The possibility for conflicts are almost endless, but the vision in the church is destructive. In every instance, the best interests of the Lord and others are sacrificed. So when we look at the interests of ourselves, the interests of the Lord and others are sacrificed and the church is destroyed. But when we look for the interests of others, pursue things of others, we make for peace and build the church back up and make the church stay successful and the church continue doing the mission of the Lord. That might mean a ministry idea that you have might not go the way you planned or might not even happen because someone else had a different ministry idea or a different idea in the church that works better. That might mean you think the church spends the money one way, but then others have them how to spend the money a different way, and you realize, hey, that's a better way. I'll put the interest of others before myself. So what does this example look like? Well, that brings us to point two. Christ is our perfect example. In verse five, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying that we should be like Christ. Paul is saying have the same mind, or as the New American Standard Bible puts it, have the same attitude of Christ. True unity, true humility, and regarding others more important than ourselves can only come through Jesus Christ. We cannot do it on our own. No matter how much we practice it, no matter how much we try to do good, if you do not have Jesus, you will fail. So Paul is saying, be like Jesus. So how did Jesus act? Well, Paul is going to give us examples here as we go through this. In verse 6, who thought, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. In verse 7, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So we first we see that Jesus became a servant. God Almighty became man. Jesus took on flesh. It also talks about how he emptied himself. Now we want to look here at what it means about emptying himself because there is a heresy out there that will claim that Jesus was not God, that Jesus did not live like God and was not God when he walked this earth because of this verse here. It's where the Jehovah's Witnesses claim that Jesus was not fully God when he walked on this earth, that he was just man. It's a heresy that's out there. And if Jesus was not God, then he was just a man that got put to death, and then we're all in trouble, and his blood did not pay for our sins. So what did Jesus empty himself of? Was Jesus not God? No, it's not true. We see in John chapter 8, Jesus said, I am the name that God used in Exodus with Moses. And we know that he used it, and the Jews knew what it was because they wanted to stone him. He tells Thomas in John chapter 14, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If you have known me, you now know the Father. So Jesus even claimed he was God. So what did he empty himself of? Well, from the commentaries, these are the things that Jesus emptied himself. There are five things. One, his divine glory. Remember, Jesus was and is God, his divine glory. When he walked on this earth, he did not look like God. Only once was his divine glory shown, and that was at the trans figuration, and only three disciples saw it, James, John, and Peter. And when they saw his divine glory, they fell on their faces. They couldn't stand before him. And they saw Moses and Elijah with him. That was just for a short second. He gave his divine glory. Number two, he gave up his independent authority. John chapter 5, verse 30, Jesus says he seeks the will of him who sent him. Jesus was not here to do his own will, but the will of the Father. He gave up his divine authority. He also gave up some of his divine attributes. He chose not to exercise the full limit of his divine authority. He got tired. He got hungry. He suffered. He wept. He took on the emotions of mankind and said, I am not going to be God. I'm going to hold that all back. I'm going to feel pain. Number four, he gave up his eternal riches. He was born to a very poor family. He was born in a manger, not in the kingdom of a castle like he should have been or in a palace. Those that came and worshipped him at first was not the angels, but poor shepherds who were the outcasts. 
And then it wasn't even other Jews of the palace and of the rich that came. No, they were magis, Gentiles that came and worshipped him all later. And then Herod tried to kill him. He gave up his adoration. He gave up his worship and service of the angels. He came to serve, not to be served, as it says in Mark. And then finally, number five, he emptied himself of his unique, intimate, face-to-face -face with the Father. Even to the point of being forsaken on the cross. We see that at the end of the Gospels as Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now we as believers, we cannot empty ourselves to this degree. We are not God. We are man. But we can empty ourselves of anything that will hinder our obedience and service to Christ. As Jesus emptied himself and made himself pleasing to the Father, so the Father is pleased with us when we empty ourselves to please him. Again, that goes even putting my wants, my needs, not before God. I empty myself of getting it my way or how I want it done. That even means for some of our believers and brothers and sisters in Christ, they empty themselves up of the comfort of a house, a comfort of a bed, even the comfort of their own lives, and get martyred for Christ. India right now is ramping up persecution on the church. China is dynamiting churches and pulling believers out during COVID under these house, and they're locked in, and they're never seen again. They empty themselves for Christ. We give up our own comforts for him. John MacArthur writes, The humble believer is aware of his rights and privileges as a child of God, but refuses to cling to them. He empties himself of all claims to earthly benefits and those rights and privileges might seem to merit. We say, no, I give up my rights. That's hard for Americans. We love our rights. But God, Jesus Christ, gave up his rights for us. We too are to give up our rights that we get as a heavenly child to follow after Jesus. In verse 7b, we see that Jesus became a bond servant, or as the ESV puts it, a servant, but the Greek word is bond servant, or another word we might know as slave. We hate that word. We don't like that word, slave. Now, you might be saying, well, wait a minute, Jesus was a slave? I, I don't see that. Well, as Paul always claimed, he was a bond servant of Christ. Let's talk about how Jesus was. Jesus, who was God in all his glory, came to earth as a humble man and owed nothing to his name. Remember, Jesus even said he had no place to lay his head. Jesus had no house, no land, no horse, no gold, no boat. He even had to borrow a donkey to ride into on Jerusalem. Jesus' life belonged to God the Father. Everything Jesus did was for the will of the Father, not his own. That is a slave. They do the will of those that own him or that are over him. And that was, Jesus did the will of the Father. We see this in John chapter 6, verse 38. Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So Jesus even claims that I'm not here to do my own mission. Also, bond servants were to carry other people's burdens. Jesus carried a burden that no man or woman could ever carry, and that was the sins of the world, our sins, my sins. He carried them to the cross. And he paid the price of death, the price that we were supposed to pay. We are to be like Jesus. We are not to do things of our own accord, but do things of our master, of our Lord, Jesus Christ. As Paul makes it to be in Romans, we were bought with the price, the price of Jesus' blood. Christ came into the likeness of man. Now, he was not a clone. He was not in disguise. He was 100% man. And as I talked about before, he knew our weaknesses. He felt our pain. He knew what it was like to be tired, cold, hot, sad. He even knew what it was like to lose a best friend. As it tells us that Jesus wept when he saw the women crying over Lazarus' death. He knew that pain. He felt that pain. Jesus gave up his appearance of being like God and took on the appearance of a man. If Jesus was sitting here today, if it was, we were back 2,000 years ago, we would not recognize him. Isaiah 53 shows us that we would not recognize Jesus. If you want to turn with your Bibles or come up here on the screen, Isaiah 53, 2. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of a dying ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus was not a handsome man. You couldn't pick him out of a crowd. He was plain. 
You wouldn't recognize there's nothing about Jesus that said, I am God, look at me. No, he was a bondservant. He took on our likeness. He even humbled himself to take on our flesh that he might die. We see this in verse 8. Paul makes it clear, in being found in the human form, he humbled himself by by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul stresses death on a cross. Why death on a cross? Because it is the most shameful death anyone could take. Even the Jewish law said, cursed is he who hangs on a tree. He was stripped. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was spit on. His beard was ripped out from him. Crucifixion was one of the most horrible deaths and finally got outlawed from how bad it was. But Jesus did not stop before his death. No, he went willingly and obediently. He went to glorify the Father. Jesus' mind was not on the interest of himself or man, but on the interest of Father. It was not about us for why Jesus died. It was not for himself. It was all about the Father. If we ever make the cross about ourselves, we have missed the message of the cross. It was all about the glory of the Father. Crucifixion includes so many horrible pains and ghastly pains. It caused dizziness, cramp, thirst, sleeplessness, even traumatic fever. And Jesus' back was ripped open, so every time he pushed up to breathe, he had splinters going in to his flesh, into his organs. And crucifixion made it even painful to breathe. Every time he pushed up on the wounds of the nails to let out air and to take in air and fall back down, he did this over and over and over again. And then he did something that none of us will ever know. God turned his back on his son. And the holy, righteous, perfect God took sin upon his body. That the sky went black. You can imagine, can't imagine how bad that'll be. But let it be known that God did not force Jesus to the cross. God did not put a gun to Jesus' head and say, you have to die. No, Jesus had free will. And he chose to die because he chose to obey God rather than man or his own free will. Jesus is our perfect example on how to be humble and how to obey God the Father. To follow Christ even when it costs everything. Charles Purgeon said this on his commentary on Philippians 2. He humbled himself. So be you not unwilling to humble yourself. Lower than the cross Christ could not go. His death was one of such extreme agony that he could not even been more disgraced and degraded. But you, willing to take the lowest place in the church of God and to to render the humblest servant, count it an honor to be able to wash the saints' feet. Be humble in mind. Nothing is lost by cherishing this spirit, for you see how Jesus was honored in the end. This moves us on to point three. Humility brings exaltation in God's eyes. Humility is the key for unity in the church. There's no other way. We have to be humble. As soon as pride enters the church, it will die, it will split, there will be issues. There was a problem when I was at Excelsior Springs. There were two Baptist churches in the town. One was founded in the 1800s by Jesse James' father, um, Pisgah Baptist Church. It was founded around 1850. And then Excelsior Springs Baptist Church, or it was known at First Baptist Church, was founded after the Civil War sometime. And neither church could get along with each other. We were both Southern Baptists. We both believed in the Baptist faith and message. We both believed in the Bible. But somewhere in their history between the two churches, long before I got there, they had a fight amongst each other. And they could never ever bring it together. And the biggest competition was numbers. Was numbers. There was at one point when Pisgah was going down and the First Baptist Church in Excelsior Springs grew in tons of numbers. Don't know why, just how it happened. And so Pisgah got mad because they didn't want to have unity because we had more numbers than they did. And then somewhere as, as time changes around the 80s, First Baptist Church became Excelsior Springs Baptist Church. They moved and replanted, and they didn't have as many numbers, and Pisgah grew and got more numbers. So then the roles switched. Then Excelsior was mad at Pisgah because they had more people. Pride. That's all it was, was pride. They were so happy, so proud of how many people they wanted, and the other church wanted that many numbers instead of realizing we are the church of Jesus Christ. And what's sad, in our denomination alone, 
this happens from town to town. When I was at Midwestern, behind us was a couple blocks with a road, and there were seven Baptist churches down this main road for like four or five blocks. And what was sad, each church, you learned, came off another split, and they just kept going down and down, and when it split, a new church would start, and more members would come. They weren't reaching the people. That area had some of the most lost people ever, with seven churches down about a mile and a half of a road. Seven Southern Baptist churches. Yet the town in that area has some of the highest unchurched people, unchristian area. Why? Because the churches, all they could see was pride in their own selves. We had several professors try to go into those churches and try to correct their mind, and it was a battle, and it was a fight. Because they weren't humble like Christ. But yet, humility leaves to being exalted by God, and we see this with Jesus through the rest. In verse 10, I'm sorry, verse 9, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And when we humble ourselves, God will exalt us also. We see this in several places in Scripture. First one is Matthew 23, 12. Whoever exalts himself will be humble. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. James 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you. Now, it needs to be noted, we will not be exalted as high as Jesus Christ. We will not be given a name above every name. Why? Because we are man and not God. We are sinful human beings. But God will exalt us as he exalted Christ Jesus. As Christ Jesus is our perfect example, and we humble himself, ourselves like him, as God exalted Jesus, God will exalt us. What is that exaltation? We really don't know. The Bible's not clear. But one of the things we do know that it is, and that the commentary states, it is salvation. You see, no pri- proud person will come to God and say, I am a sinner. I am wrong. I need your help, God. You have to humble yourselves before God to ask for salvation. Because no one who is proud wants to do it with anybody's help. They only want to do it on themselves. So being humble tells God, I need your son to save me. I need to be forgiven. And we are exalted by putting into the kingdom of God in heaven. But just because we become humble and ask for salvation does not mean we become prideful. No, we stay humble all the days of our lives, serving the Father, and we glorify the Father, for we're not doing it for our own glory, but for his glory. As we see, Jesus is given a name above every other name. Now, I want you to know that Jesus' name, when he first walked on this earth, is a biblical Hebrew name. It's still out there. It sounds like Joshua. You have people down in South America. They have the name Jesus. It's just a regular name. But Jesus' name became exalted because of his death. You see that in verse 10, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. It's not anybody who has the name Jesus. Only Jesus Christ's name is that way. Only his name. Yes, every knee shall bow. Those on the earth, those above the earth, which are the angels, and those worshiping him, those of us who are here on the earth, we're here when Jesus comes back, and yes, those in hell, Satan and his demons, and those that have fallen away. This does not give us a get-out-of-jail-free card. This is not salvation for everyone. That's, that's another heresy that is taught. Oh, since everybody's going to fall and worship Jesus, that means everybody's saved. No. That is that decision you have to make here on earth to ask Jesus to save you from your sins or not. But even those, those atheists, those who believe that there's another way to heaven or those who will never call upon Jesus' name, yes, they will be forced to say Jesus is Lord. They will have to admit it. Satan will have to admit it. The demons will. It does not mean that those that have died and gone to hell who do not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior get to be saved this time. They just still will announce it and worship him as he should deserve his worship. And this is done because of Jesus' great obedience that everyone will worship him. This is done, the reason we worship him now is because of his great obedience. 
because he is Lord. And the word Lord here is only used in the Old Testament for God the Father. Now Paul writes it for Jesus Christ because Jesus is God. And he is the only one that could have paid the sin, paid the price of sin and bring victory over sin. But notice who receives glory at the end of verse 11. It's not Jesus. Jesus isn't the one that receives glory, no. To the glory of God the Father, God is still receiving glory from the Son. It's still not about Jesus. It's still not about Him. It's still about only God the Father. Yes, Jesus did this great work. Yes, Jesus paid the price. Yes, Jesus rose again on the third day. Yes, Jesus is the Son of God sitting at the right hand of the Father. But God is still receiving the glory because all of Jesus' life was to bring glory to God. All our lives is to bring glory to God. It's not about you. It's not about your glory. It's not about your name. It's not about the plaques or the trophies or whatever you're going to get. It's all about God the Father. And if you are not living that way, Repent and put it back to God the Father. Put ourselves back in the right mindset. If this church is not about God the Father, then this church will cease to be the church and the keys will be removed from by Jesus. We don't sit here as a church for a social club or to have fun. We sit here to bring glory to God the Father and that those around us will come into this fellowship to glorify the Father. That is the mission of the church. And Jesus is still doing that today. Every time a sinner comes to the foot of the cross and asks for forgiveness of sins and asks us for salvation through Jesus Christ, it says that the angels glorify. Who are they glorifying? Not the sinner, not Jesus. They're glorifying God, the Father, for the great thing that he set up. That's happening every time. And then as that Christian believer grows and matures and reads his Bible or her Bible and praises God, the Father, glory is still going to Jesus Christ, who then goes off to God the Father. Because without God the Father, there would be no Jesus Christ. You see how this continually works. The Holy Spirit in you is convicting you of your sins so you can bring praises and glory to God the Father through our great mediator, Jesus Christ. So in conclusion, why should we be humble? So we can bring glory to the Father. Humble, being humble says it's the Father that is doing the work, not me. The reason I told about that bow accident, people can say, you're lucky. Wow, that's amazing. You didn't get hurt. It had nothing to do with luck. It was God the Father that protected me. It had nothing to do with my reflexes for I didn't know it was going to break until it hit me in point whatever seconds. It had nothing to do with the way I was standing and all that. No, it had to do with God the Father protecting me. All glory to him. Being humble points others to Christ, who can glorify the Father. Being full of pride brings glory only to ourselves. Being prideful said, it's all about me, not about anyone else. So the church, if we make it about us, not Jesus, the church will fail. We'll hurt others and we'll hurt Christ's bride, the church. But if we make it about Jesus and humble ourselves and follow Jesus' example, then the church can truly glorify the Father as is meant to be. So who are you? The humble servant like Jesus Christ or the proud servant who wants all the glory? Maybe it's time that we let go of that pride and follow Jesus' example. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to be humble. Lord, don't ever let it be all about us. Lord, don't ever let it be all about me for it's not about me but for you. Lord, let us be your humble servant that follows after you and that lives for you and for your glory so that others may see our works and rejoice in the Father and that other sinners who are lost may see our lives and want to know what is different about us and we can point them back to Jesus, the Savior, the Master of our faith. Lord, help us to be humble. Help us to worship only you. In Jesus' name, amen.